Hey, it's Dr. Joyelle, and welcome to the Women's Health Pearl Show. We are here to educate and empower women to own their health so they can optimize their overall wellness. We're going to talk about breast cancer. One in eight or 12% of women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. But there are 3.8 million women who survive, who are breast cancer survivors. More, this is more than other cancer survivor groups. So women do survive breast cancer. And it's very important to talk about not only surviving, but thriving after this diagnosis. So I'm happy to bring on my friend, Dr. Natalie McKenzie, who is living proof of a breast cancer survivor who is thriving and empowering women to do the same. She is a GYN oncologist. She is an expert in all GYN cancers. And she is also just received a Distinguished Advocacy Award from the International Gynecologic Cancer Society for her advocacy for survivor patients in the United States and Haiti. Welcome, Dr. Natalie McKenzie, to the show. Thank you so much, Joyelle, for having me on your show today. I'm really excited to talk about breast cancer awareness as well as uh, empowerment and thriving after cancer. Yes, I'm very excited for this conversation also. So let's start by just wanting you to kind of tell us a little bit about your journey, um, how long ago you were diagnosed with breast cancer, and what can you remember your initial thoughts or feeling when you received your diagnosis? Certainly. The uh, cancer diagnosis is always tough to receive, and mine was no different. I was a second year OBGYN resident at the time, and so I was already uh, in my training process of becoming a women's health uh, physician, but um, I was also very much interested in taking care of patients with cancer. Uh, so when I was diagnosed with um, my breast cancer diagnosis, it was really hard to take, um, but I was thankful that I was already a physician and I understood what was going on it's always hard. It's hard for the patient. It's hard. It was hard for my husband. We were newlyweds at the time. Um, that's not the type of news you want as a very young woman. When you see your whole life ahead of you, you and you want to make babies, you want to live happily ever after. But it was what it was. And um, when we think about mindset, uh, one of the things that I remember when I was uh, undergoing chemotherapy uh, for breast cancer is uh, how I decided very early on that I was not going to let the cancer win and I was not going to let it take the quality of my life. So for me, it was very important that I look the cancer in the mirror. Uh, and I did that. I stood in my bedroom and I remember looking at the mirror and saying, not not now, not ever. It's my life, and I decide how this is going to play out. That, that is awesome, because I personally, with my patients, when they have this very, like you said, just devastating news, it's really important to, you know, like you said, say to yourself, this diagnosis does not own my life. Um, you really have to, like you said, take control and, you know, you know fight and, you know, essentially go through the things that you have to go through in order to get to the other side. So I want to talk to you, like you said, you looked yourself in the mirror, talk to you about um, the importance of the, the mindset, the mindset shift as you're going through the you know process of treatment and then, you know, ultimately, he you know, healing. There are a lot of women, you know, after they finish treatment, they're, you know, really, um, afraid of what the new normal will look like, or, you know, or they're, they're, very anxious to get back to normal. So what kind of mindset shift do you need to have or do you recommend women to have as they're going through, you know, their treatment and then ultimately, you know, after treatment as far as healing? Absolutely. So mindset is incredibly important uh, when you're going through any chronic disease, including 
cancer care. Uh, you really want to uh, think about yourself, think about self-care self and all of the wonderful things that you know to be true uh, in terms of caring for yourself. But more importantly, when we think about mindset, we think about uh, positive versus negative, um, reframing your thoughts and so that you can think about them in a way that uh, you accept uh, help from the universe. You realize that your loved ones, your, your community, your family, your friends uh, that are there to support you, don't alienate them, uh, don't push them aside, uh, welcome their help because we know that one of the strongest predictors of longevity is social connectedness. So don't push people away during times of trouble, accept their help, accept their love. Uh, it's going to make a difference. And really uh, glass, glass half full, really think about uh, opportunities, those things that you can control. You can control how you wake up in the morning. You can control if you meditate, when you wake up or before you go to sleep uh, to really harness positive energy. And if you're a spiritual person, you know, um, harness your faith and harness your, your faith community. All of these things are, are powerful predictors of how well people do uh, with a cancer diagnosis. Very true. And like you said, I think community is definitely important. Like surrounding yourself with your family or your close friends. Do you ever, um, recommend, you know, cancer support groups? I mean, I know you probably do, but it's something that's that something high on your priority list for women to join just to get that community of around women who are going through the same things or, or that's something that you, you know, often recommend? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I started uh, an eight week um, cancer survivorship program uh, it's an actual, it's a medical program uh, with myself and 10 other uh, experts from uh, cooking demonstration chefs to nutritionists to exercise physiologists, physical therapists, sex therapists, body image esthetician, because that's also a really big deal for cancer survivors like myself, um, and um, a mental health counselor. Um, and in addition to my, the group that I started, we encourage patients to participate in other uh, support groups and peer-led support groups with um, cancer survivors that are leading the groups and they're meeting in their local communities or at their churches and either they're participating in activities that they find beneficial or healing or sometimes they're just talking about their experience, they're sharing their, their stories together and they're empowering each other. So I think women need to also be aware of the long term effects, even after a treatment, you know, they're they can experience um, pain, they can experience fatigue, mood changes, depression or even uh, menopausal symptoms because of the hormonal treatment for breast cancer, like hot flashes or vaginal dryness. So I think it's important for us to discuss how women can be more proactive to lessen these symptoms or even decrease the incidence of them. And I wanted to talk to you about the importance of a healthy diet. Like how, what are your thoughts in regards to a healthy diet or the process of healing afterwards? Joelle, that's a great question. In fact, um, the top three things that make a difference in cancer prevention and how you do after a cancer treatment are um, social determinants, uh, social connectedness, like we talked about, diet and physical activity. So let's talk about diet first. We know from multiple uh, numerous studies that eating a whole food, predominantly plant-based diet makes a huge difference. Avoiding sweets, minimizing the amount of alcohol, minimizing the uh, amount of um, juice, uh, and uh, trying to eliminate uh, or really strongly minimize things like sodas and processed foods. We know that red meat is a type one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. So if you are going to eat red meat, eat it um, in moderation and from non um, grass fed organic sources. But really your entire plate should be full of veggies and some fruits. Why? Because uh, whole, whole foods, um, things that come from nature have a hundred bioactive chemicals. They have hundreds and hundreds of phy phytonutrients that are incredibly helpful um, and uh, beneficial to our health. All of the functions within our bodies really need 
uh, the, the nutrients and the chemicals found in these plants to function optimally. And when we don't consume these substances, we are walking around nutritionally deficient and we are really malnourished. So uh, food makes a huge difference in cancer prevention and optimizing your immune system, like COVID, for example, and in helping uh, fight cancer. Those are great points. And also you wrote recently an article about the impact of gut health. Can you talk a little bit about the, the interaction? You know, you talked about, you know, healthy foods and, you know, basically food is, you know, the, the, our best medicine, how food can actually impact our, you know, optimization or optimizing our gut health. Absolutely. So we know that, um, First of all, we may not know that. So let me backtrack and tell you a little bit about the gut microbiome. So the organisms that live within our intestines, whether it's bacteria, fungi, viruses, but predominantly bacteria that live in our intestines uh, have evolved and have been in our, our, our systems for uh, thousands of years. And we have evolved along with these bacteria, these friendly bacteria that live in our intestines to cohabitate and we and live in a symbiotic relationship. And so they have evolved to um, perform functions for us that we don't have to do anymore. So they metabolize uh, some of the substances that we consume and they are able to produce something called metabolites that have functions within our bodies that we don't have to do anymore. Our genes don't have to um, perform some of these functions. So these friendly bacteria produce uh, important substances, important metabolites like butyrate and propionate, which are uh, short chain fatty acids. They live on fiber and good fats. So if we are not consuming high fiber diets, again, going back to the predominantly plant-based diet, if we're not consuming enough fiber and good fats, then those friendly bacteria whose job it is to produce certain metabolites in abundance for us um, are not receiving their substrates. So we have uh, this symbiotic relationship with the friendly bacteria that live within our intestines or gut, and um, they can't work optimally unless we give, we eat what we need to eat. And what, when we eat what feeds these bacteria, it's called prebiotics. Right, so there's probiotics. If you don't have enough diversity in your gut, it's kind of like the, um, you know, like stock market diversifying your portfolio. Well, you have to have a diverse gut microbiome as well. You have to have an abundance of many, many friendly bacteria. Uh, having just one group of bacteria is not good enough. So having a diverse group of bacteria in our gut and making sure that we consume the substances that allow them to be optimal and, um, and for these functions to be optimal within our intestines. Right. So everyone, eat the rainbow so we can support our gut health. <laughs> so let's switch over to exercise. And there are some studies that suggest that exercise or consistent exercise can decrease the recurrence of cancer or breast cancer. Um, so what have your, what have you been recommending as far as exercise to your um, survivors? Well, I've been recommending um, any kind of movement. We know that the guidelines for Americans is to participate in 150 uh, minutes per week of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. So moderate could be like um, a tennis double or um, jogging down the street, whereas vigorous would be uh, fast running or tennis singles or um, any, uh, any type of activity where you are really sweating and, um, and really raising your energy. But even walking is important. Everybody has to start off um, where they're at. You don't have to try and get to some magical level before you begin physical activity. So if all you can do is walk for 10 minutes a, a day, walk for 10 minutes a day. 
Uh, but eventually, we do want to work up to those guidelines. We understand, especially when we're talking about cancer survivors, um, surgery, uh, chemotherapy may have impacted their physical function, and they're not all able to participate and moderate or, phys or, or vigorous activity. So start where you're at, do whatever you can, but start moving. Totally agree with that. Definitely starting where you are and, and being okay with that. Like some people get frustrated with themselves and get you know angry, but just being okay with, you know, giving yourself grace and being okay with where you are and just, you know, making slight adjustments every so often to get to the ultimate goal. So that's a very good point. So Can I lastly, you, right you being an advocate for, uh, So there could be differences when at the as far as the age of a woman when she's diagnosed, you know, younger woman versus an older woman at the time of diagnosis. What has your experience been in regards to counseling those patients? Because you know, obviously given their ages, their difference in ages, they may they will experience the process differently. Absolutely. Um so cancer uh, patients go through a plethora of emotions and they definitely bring their age and life experience uh, into it. So a young woman may be grappling with um, being diagnosed with cancer before she started her family. So she's thinking more about uncle fertility issues whereby she's interested in maybe freezing eggs. Maybe she hasn't uh, met that person with whom she wants to start her family yet. So all of these factors come into play whereby um, numerous different specialists come into the mix to better counsel her about her future goals. Um, but also, if you take uh, our older patients, for example, they may have other issues that they're dealing with. Maybe they already have other chronic diseases that are going to play a role in what kind of surgeries they might be candidate for or what kind of uh, uh, cancer therapies they might be candidates for. So definitely age and many other factors play a role in how uh, patients uh, view their diagnosis, deal with their diagnosis, and what kind types of treatments they're eligible for. So you being a advocate for survivor patients, um, let's talk about self-advocacy, you know, encouraging and educating women to be advocates for themselves. You know, personally, I encourage patients to, you know, get the facts as far as their diagnosis, um, the treatment plan, and you know things to expect. What kind of things do you do or talk about with your patients for them to you know advocate for themselves during this process of you know diagnosis, treatment, and healing afterwards? Absolutely, I you, I couldn't agree with you more, Joyelle. Um, advocating for oneself is incredibly important uh, throughout the journey. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out before I go on is that the American Cancer Society has a lot of helpful uh, information uh, for patients battling any kind of cancer, whereby they can understand a little bit more about how their cancer came to be. Uh, um, and it may be helpful for them to know if there are risk factors and there's a family dis um, disposition. Maybe other uh, family members can start thinking about what they might do to mitigate those risks. So uh, that's number one. Number two, they talk about different stages because different treatments are appropriate for different stages along the continuum. So what is appropriate to treat a stage one cancer is not necessarily the same type of treatment that, that a stage four cancer patient is going to um, be eligible for. And so um, it's not good enough that your neighbor or your, your best friend even, uh, whatever treatment they might have had, you it may not be the same for you. So educating yourself as to what is appropriate based on the stage, grade, and, and different little variables about um, uh, the cancer uh, that is specific to an individual are important. And then again, of course, cancer survivorship, their uh, cancer survivorship and surveillance strategies. So I just wanted to point that out with regards to uh, the American Cancer Society, and there are plenty of others, but that's one reputable source. So that's number one. 
Uh, number two, um, when you have those facts, then you can start being your own advocate. So uh, doing the research, learning about your diagnosis, whether it's cancer or anything else, um, and then really um, making sure that you have uh, a group of physicians or healthcare professionals that listen to you. It's important that they listen to you and that you listen to yourself, getting to know your body, getting to know what's normal for you uh, so that you can begin to understand when you have new symptoms that they are new and that you don't mistake them for, you know, like I take care of ovarian cancer patients. You don't mistake uh, something brewing for just gas. Uh, if you know your body, then you'll, you'll better be able to recognize new symptoms. So listen to your body. Make sure you have healthcare professionals that listen to you. And then uh, making sure that you educate yourself so that you can have a real conversation with those medical professionals and you can keep them to task. Those are awesome points. Definitely listening is the key word here. Like I said, listen to your body. But, you know, I think the most important thing that patients and, you know, women in general want to, they want to be heard, um, especially during this very difficult time. So those are all very great points. So I want to thank you, Dr. Natalie, for all the work that you do um, in this realm of, you know, breast cancer survivorship, as well as cancer, um, GYN cancer um, survivor. And uh, welcome and thank you for coming to the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, this is Dr. Joyelle with the Women's Health Pro Show, where we bring you real talk about real women's issues. <laughs>